recording this. Um, so just so everyone is aware, but I just want to thank you all for coming and joining us for our um, SNAP 101 presentation um, for college students specifically. Um, I want to give um, a special shout out to Katie from Coalition Against Hunger um, for coming and doing this presentation for us today. Um, my name is Mallory Swires. I am an intern that, um, with the Resource Pantry on campus um, at the Center for Civic Engagement and Social Impact. Um, I'm, I've been working with them um, to sort of develop new programming on campus that can help students um, gain access to things like SNAP, WIC, um, Live Heat, Medicaid um, as part of um, our new Benefits Hub um, program um, that should be coming um, in the future. Um, I also want to give a special shout out to Megan from Chester County Food Bank for um, setting this up with me um, so you guys can all um, learn more about your SNAP benefits. Um, uh, so this is being recorded and after the fact it will be posted on our website um, if you guys want to access this after the fact or know anybody that was not able to join us today. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm going to turn it over to Katie, um, who can um, hopefully answer all of you guys' questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Uh, my name is Katie Milholland, and I am the Director of Policy and Education at the Greater Philadelphia Coalition Against Hunger. And today we're going to be talking about SNAP and specifically SNAP for college students. Um, one quick housekeeping thing. I love questions. If you have a question, please do not feel like you need to save it until the end. Go ahead and ask it, you know, right as it comes up. The only thing I have to ask is I have learned over, you know, the past two years working from home that sharing my screen, giving a presentation and monitoring the chat are just too many things for me to focus on at once. So if you have a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask it verbally. Um, if for whatever reason you can't do that and any questions do come up in the chat, Mallory, maybe if you could be just monitoring and, and ask them verbally if they come up. Yeah, that is fine. Any, anybody with a question can throw it in the chat and then I can um, unmute and ask for them. Great, thanks so much. All right, so the first thing that we need to do is really just talk about, you know, what are we here to learn about today? And the answer is SNAP, which stands for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Now, SNAP is the program that was previously called food stamps. So if you're familiar with food stamps, you're familiar with SNAP. It's the same program, it just goes by a new name. So SNAP is a federally funded monthly nutrition program. It provides people with money to purchase food items at grocery stores, participating farmers markets, and participating corner stores. SNAP deposits money onto an access card, which is similar to a debit card. And what I have on the screen right there is a picture of a Pennsylvania access card. So you can see it's very similar, you know, looking to a debit card or credit card, you would swipe that card at the end of a transaction, just like you would a debit card. You have a pin number for your access card, just like you would a debit card. Really, the difference between a debit card and an access card is that your purchases with an access card are going to be restricted to food items only. So with your SNAP dollars on your access card, you'll be able to purchase fruits, veggies, pasta, et cetera, um, but not things like toilet paper and paper towels. So restricted to food items only. And the benefit range for a single person is anywhere from $20 to $250, and that benefit does go up the more people in your household. And there is an asterisk next to that number, and we will talk about why a little bit later in the presentation. So SNAP is so important because it really directly responds to hunger. It directly helps those in need by putting dollars in their pockets that they can spend on food to cover basic food and nutrition. It encourages dignity by empowering SNAP participants to you know, make their own selections on the food that they're putting in their bodies. It lessens the stress of heat, treat, or eat decisions. And what that means is when people have to decide between you know, paying for utilities such as heating or medicine for medical conditions or food. 
uh, by giving you money that you can put directly towards food, it lessens some of that strain. And then finally, it helps the economy, retailers, farmers, et cetera. In Pennsylvania, SNAP helps almost 1.9 million residents put food on the table, and over 28,000 of those uh, SNAP participants are in Chester County as of March 2022. SNAP benefits have temporarily increased due to the pandemic, and I'm going to walk you through exactly what that means for you. And finally, many people have misconceptions and do not realize they are eligible. That's one of the reasons why I'm so grateful to be here speaking to all of you today to hopefully, you know, set right some of those misconceptions. And the other reason that SNAP is so crucially important is because the reality is emergency food providers, while such an important resource in our country, cannot do it alone. For every one meal a food bank provides, SNAP provides nine. So SNAP is such an important part of nutrition assistance in our country. And that's why often you'll hear, hear people refer to it as the first line of defense against hunger. So the, you know, the first question that we really have to address is who can get SNAP? And the answer might surprise you. A lot of times people think SNAP is a little bit more restricted than it is. And the reality is almost anyone with low income. And that's going to include families with children, seniors and persons with disabilities, workers with low wages and or part-time hours, unemployed individuals, but then there are certain groups of people for whom SNAP rules are a little bit more restricted. And unfortunately, one of those groups is college students. So some college students are eligible for SNAP and more with some COVID expansions that I'll get into later. And then certain immigrants are also eligible for SNAP. The rules for SNAP for determining if you qualify and then how big your benefit amount is going to be are your household size, your gross income, and that's your income before taxes, allowable deductions, those are going to be, you know, specific expenses that you pay. And then finally, rules for special groups. And those special groups are going to be college students, seniors and individuals with disabilities, and immigrants. So that's an overview, but don't worry, I'm really going to walk you through the whole thing. So the first thing that we need to talk about is, you know, a SNAP household. That's sort of the first thing you have to determine, how many people are in your household. And when we're talking about a household for SNAP purposes, there is a really specific definition. So the basic definition of a household is people who live together and buy and prepare meals together. So that's going to be, you know, families, married couples, etc. To help us really understand this definition, we have a few different ways of putting it. Um, so other definitions would be a person living with others who buys food and prepares meals separately. So this is going to be roommates, renters, friends. And honestly, this is what we see a lot, you know, with college students as college students who might be living with roommates. Uh, if you are living with roommates, but purchasing and preparing food separately on your own, you actually do not have to include your roommates in your SNAP household. You could be a SNAP household of one, even though you might be in the same, you know, physical building as those roommates. And then, of course, finally, a person living alone who buys food and prepares meals alone. Um, and the reason is just sometimes, you know, those single person households get overlooked. So that's going to be, you know, seniors who are living alone or single individuals who live alone. So that's really the first question. How many people are in your SNAP household? And now there are a few special rules for relatives. So there are a few people who fall into the category of what we call mandatory household members. And mandatory household members must apply together as one household always, no matter what. So this is going to be spouses who live together must always apply as a household together, regardless of how they handle the purchasing and preparing of food. Children under 22 years of age who are living with their parents 
also must always apply in the same household of their parents, regardless of how they are handling the purchasing of preparing of food. And this does apply to biological, adopted, and stepchildren, and parents of children aged 21 years, 21 years of age or younger. So what that means is, you know, if a 21-year-old is living with their parents, they would have to apply in a household with their parents. And if that 21-year-old themselves has a child, all of those people, the child, the 21-year-old, and their parents would all sort of be grouped into a singular household under this mandatory household member rule. And then the last category of mandatory household members is others under 18 years of age living under parental supervision. So that's going to be, you know, cousins, nieces, nephews who are living with family members, you know, under parental supervision always must apply in a SNAP household with those family members, again, regardless of how food is being handled. So those are the mandatory household members. So the next thing we're going to talk about is these rules for college students that I keep alluding to, because I think this is sort of really the crux of why we're here today is understanding these rules. Now, unfortunately, all college students under the current regulations are not eligible for SNAP. There are additional eligibility criteria that college students must meet in order to qualify for SNAP. So always eligible, even pre-COVID, the um, qualifications that college students could meet to qualify for SNAP are if a college student is caring for a child under the age of six or under the age of 12 if the student is a single parent in college full time. A college student working 20 hours a week or more qualifies for SNAP. A college student receiving work study qualifies for SNAP. The next category is, you know, physically or mentally unfit. Now that is such a terrible way to put that. And it's in quote because it's in quotes because that is a direct quote from the SNAP handbook. That is certainly not the way that I would choose to express that qualification. But what that means is have a medical barrier to employment. College students under the age of 18 or over the age of 50 would qualify for SNAP. College students who are enrolled less than half time. So if someone is only taking a part time schedule, they don't need to worry about you know, qualifying for SNAP. And then finally qualified uh, for one of a few other small exceptions. Also in Pennsylvania, almost all community college students qualify for SNAP. And then finally, there has been an expansion of student qualification because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Students who are work study eligible, even if they are not in a work study position. And the reason this is, is because during the pandemic, there were lots of students who have been work study eligible, but there just haven't been work study positions for those students to be in. Those students still qualify, whether they're working in that work study or not. And finally, students with an expected family contribution of zero dollars are eligible due to COVID. Now, these COVID expansions are tied to the public health emergency, the federal public health emergency, which was just extended until July 15th of 2022. So as of now, until July 15th of 2022, these uh, COVID expansions of college student rules will be in effect. And the last thing I want to do is I just want to make it very clear, college students must meet one of these eligibility criteria, and then they also must meet all of the other criteria to qualify for SNAP. So this is sort of the first determination. As a college student, are you eligible? Once you have the answer to that question, then you have to see if you meet the income qualifications, which we'll talk about next. And then the second question that always comes up with college students is sort of this question of, for SNAP purposes, what does it mean to be enrolled? So for example, with summer break coming up, how is that going to affect your enrollment? Are you still going to be subject to those additional qualifications? Um, and the answer is unfortunately most likely. Um, a student's enrollment begins on the first day of school term and a student's enrollment ends upon graduation, suspension, expulsion, dropping out or not intending to register for the next normal school term. So a student who was enrolled during the spring term and intends to enroll for the fall term 
is considered enrolled during summer vacation, unfortunately. So a student in that situation would still be subject to those additional SNAP rules, even though they wouldn't be, you know, technically attending school during that summer break. And then finally, enrollment status continues when a student graduates and intends to enroll in a new course of study for the next normal school term. So for example, if a student graduates in the spring and intends to enroll in grad school or intends to enroll in another degree program in the fall, they would be considered still enrolled over the summer. I wish that the rules were not quite so restrictive, but unfortunately, these are the regulations that we all need to adhere to. And then finally, I do want to go through these other special groups because we understand that people do not fit neatly into these boxes of one particular group or the other and that people have many different living situations. And so, you know, there are many different household compositions. So when we talk about uh, SNAP, when we talk about the term elderly or senior, we are always talking about a person who is 60 years old or older. And when we talk about disability for SNAP purposes, we mean a person who has been approved for disability benefits. So things like SSI, SSDI, VA disability benefits, et cetera. So seniors and those with disabilities, if there is a senior or an individual with a disability in your household, your household is subject to a slightly higher income limit, up to 200% of the poverty line. And we are going to look at the income limits in a really clear chart on one of the next slides. Households where all members are elderly or have disabilities and that have no earned income. So all of the income would be coming from things like disability benefits, pensions, what we call unearned income, um, can use a simplified two-page application. And then they also have less paperwork and are certified for a three-year period. These households should be sure to keep track of medical expenses that are over $35 per month because reporting these expenses for these households may help to increase SNAP benefits. And then finally, the last category is non-citizens. Now, non-citizens fall into several categories when it comes to SNAP. There are non-citizens who are eligible right away. There are non-citizens who have a five-year waiting period. And there are non-citizens who are not eligible at all. So eligible right away would be able to receive SNAP immediately or what we call qualified immigrants, or sometimes uh, they are referred to as LPRs or legal permanent residents. And these are going to be people who, for example, have a green card, uh, who are age 17 or younger, qualify immediately. They are absolutely eligible for SNAP. Anybody who is receiving disability benefits, so for example, GA or state-funded medical assistance, and then finally, refugees or asylees or other humanitarian immigrants qualify for SNAP right away. But unfortunately, there are other non-citizens who have a five-year waiting period. So any legal permanent resident, 18 years or older, who has had qualified status for less than five years. So legal permanent residents who are 17 and younger are eligible right away. But unfortunately, if you are 18 or older, you must have had that green card or had that qualified status for five full years before you are eligible for SNAP. And then finally, not eligible at all um, are going to be undocumented immigrants, non-qualified immigrants, so for example, uh, DACA or asylum applicants. And then finally, anyone who is here on a visitor or a tourist visa is also not going to qualify for SNAP. All right, so I've been alluding to this page for uh, some time, and here we are at the SNAP income limits. Now, the SNAP income limits change every October 1st. So these are the income limits as of October 1st, 2021, and these income limits are going to be relevant until September 30th of 2022. So as you can see, the first thing that you need to do is determine how many people are in your household and then what type of household you are in. Are you in a household with a senior or an individual with a disability? If you are, you are going to be in that income limit all the way to the right of the chart, which is 200% of the federal poverty line. 
if you do not have a senior or an individual with a disability in your household, you are going to be in that income limit in the center, which is 160% of the poverty line. So for example, if I am a single person, I am not a senior and I do not have a disability, I can make up to $1,717 before taxes and still qualify for SNAP. Now, in Pennsylvania currently, there is no asset test. So the money that you have in the bank is not going to disqualify you for SNAP, although they will still ask about your assets on the application. So don't be freaked out by that question. Assets in Pennsylvania do not disqualify you from receiving SNAP, um, except for a very, very sm uh, small number of households Elderly disabled households can technically be eligible with higher incomes than on those that than on that chart, um, but then they would have an asset limit and would only qualify if their qualifying expenses are very high. That situation is very rare, so the vast majority of SNAP applications are going to have to adhere to these income limits and not have an asset test. So what income counts? When we're talking about those income limits, how do you know if you meet those income limits? How do you know if you're over those income limits? So income that counts is both earned income and unearned income. So earned income is going to be things like wages, uh, self-employment, AmeriCorps VISTA income if the individual was not receiving SNAP when they signed up or rental income. And then unearned income that's gonna count for the program is gonna be stuff like retirement benefits, social security and disability benefits, pensions and retirement plans, supplemental security income, VA disability benefits, and child support. So On the, maybe, yeah. It looks like we had a question in the chat. Um, was the income chart based off of monthly income or annual? Great question. It is based on monthly income before taxes. And I'll just leave this up for a few more seconds so everybody can take a look. And then I'm also happy to send this PowerPoint around afterwards, as well as a flyer that has the income limits on the on the flyer. So nobody feel like you need to write this all down right now. I'll definitely follow up with materials um, so that you can have all of this information in front of you. All right, and then uh, not every, uh, not all income counts. So there are certain things that are not going to account. So these are going to be things like tax refunds, including you know stimulus payments do not count for SNAP purposes. Educational assistance, such as grants and scholarships, do not count as income. Work study income, which is important because work study was one of the ways that college students could get SNAP. Income that comes from that work study does not count as income for SNAP purposes. AmeriCorps income does not count. AmeriCorps VISTA income does not count if the individual was receiving SNAP when they signed up. Income in kind, so this is going to be you know, free rent in exchange for odd jobs. That does not need to be reported as income. And then finally, vendor payments. So what that means is you know, someone else who pays a bill for you. So for example, a parent helps with rent, that's not gonna count as income. All right, so the next thing is basic SNAP deductions. So once you qualify based on your income, the next thing that they're gonna do is look at you know, certain deductions. So certain expenses that you pay are going to be counted for SNAP purposes, and that's gonna help determine your benefit level. So the first one is an earned income deduction. Um, so if any of the income reported comes from earned income, you are going to receive that 20% deduction. Then there's a standard deduction, which everybody gets. It varies by household. And then there are certain deductions that are really going to depend on the bills that you pay. So uh, the standard utility allowance is if you pay utilities, um, the dependent care deduction, uh, child support deduction, medical expenses can be uh, reported as a deduction for um, seniors or disabled individuals, and then finally the excess shelter deduction. So we don't need to get too clearly into these deductions, but I'm just kind of giving you a sense of the sorts of things that they'll count for SNAP purposes. So the next question is, you know, how does that all translate into benefit levels? How much SNAP are you actually going to get? 
So SNAP adds up your earned and unearned income, and then it applies all of the deductions that you qualify for to get your net income. SNAP assumes a household will spend 30% of its net income on food. The maximum SNAP benefit is supposed to be enough to eat on, but let's just acknowledge that the reality is it's not. And so the SNAP benefit that you get is going to be the difference between 30% of your net income and the maximum benefit. Pre-COVID, uh, the minimum benefit uh, of $16 for a household of one or two. Right now, the minimum benefit is technically $20 for a household of one or two. So what I have on the screen is the maximum benefit by household size. So this is the highest benefit amount um, that a household would qualify for. So I'm going to give you all, you know, a minute to just kind of leave that on the screen and take a look at it. And then I'm going to talk about why and how this has changed because of COVID. All right. So Right now, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, people are receiving what are called emergency allotments. So emergency allotments are extra SNAP payments that people get in the second half of the month. Anyone that does not receive the maximum SNAP benefit for their household size gets an emergency allotment in the second half of the month, and that emergency allotment bumps them up to the maximum benefit for their household size. So for example, a family of two who qualifies for $200 of normal SNAP is going to get that $200 payment in the first half of the month. In the second half of the month, they're going to get an emergency allotment of $230, bumping them up to the maximum benefit amount for their household size. Anybody who already qualifies for the maximum SNAP benefit for their household size is also going to get an emergency allotment in the second half of the month, and that emergency allotment is going to be $95. And then finally, if household, you know, qualifies, the difference between their SNAP and the maximum benefit is less than $95, that emergency allotment will be brought up to $95. So for example, a family that, you know, the difference between their SNAP and the maximum benefit for their household size is only $50, they're going to get an extra $45 for that full emergency allotment amount of $95. So Emergency allotments are kind of complicated. It's hard to tell you exactly how much you're going to get in regular SNAP and an emergency allotment. But really the important message here is that right now, every single person who applies for SNAP is going to get at least the maximum amount for their household size and maybe more. So that's the message. There's never been a better time to apply for SNAP. Emergency allotments are tied also to the federal public health emergency. And as I mentioned before, the federal public health emergency has been extended until July 15th of 2022. So we expect emergency allotments will be continued to be issued on a monthly basis until that federal public health emergency ends. All right, so that brings us to the Coalition Against Hunger SNAP hotline. If what I'm telling you sounds interesting and you think you qualify, um, and maybe you're not even sure, but you think you qualify, you think this sounds like it could be helpful for you, I am going to recommend applying through the Coalition Against Hunger SNAP hotline. So our SNAP hotline is a hotline we run at the Coalition Against Hunger, where we help people to apply for SNAP over the phone. And the benefit of applying through this hotline is that SNAP can be really complicated. The application process can be really long and confusing, and it can be helpful to have someone who is an expert on SNAP filling out the application with you, answering your questions, and just providing extra support to make sure your application is filled out in the right way and increasing your chances of being um, you know, accepted for benefits. So if you call our SNAP hotline, the phone is going to be answered by a staff member or a trained volunteer who is going to first screen you for eligibility. We will then put you on a list to receive a call back and you'll receive a call from one of our SNAP counselors. Again, these people are experts in SNAP and fill out hundreds of applications a month and they are going to help you apply over the phone and then submit your application with you. 
Finally, we hope that nothing goes wrong, but we know that mistakes are made in SNAP all the time. So people are incorrectly denied or receive the wrong benefit amount. If something goes wrong with your application, we can also provide case management where we will help you to call, reach out to the appropriate parties, and if necessary, advocate on your behalf until whatever went wrong is fixed. So I would really recommend if you're interested in applying for SNAP, calling our SNAP hotline, which is open Monday through Thursday, 9 to 5, Friday, 9 to 4. And I do have the number on screen, which is 215-430-0556. Now, we do try to answer every uh, phone call, but we are a small staff. And so if you call us, please do leave a message. We check our messages frequently, and we do return every call that we receive. So the next thing that we need to talk about is uh, SARS and recertifications, because the unfortunate reality is enrolling in and staying connected to SNAP requires paperwork. So the process for SNAP benefits is number one going to be completing an application. Once you complete that application, you're actually not done. You have to submit verification documents. And the verification documents that you have to submit are going to depend on your you know, unique circumstance. But if you apply through the SNAP hotline, our SNAP counselors can help you figure out exactly what documents to submit. And then the last stage of applying for SNAP is to complete a SNAP interview. So that's going to be an interview with a caseworker, and they're going to ask a lot of the same questions that you already answered on the application, but it does need to be completed in order for your application to be approved. So if you follow all three steps, your application is going to be approved, but you're not done because you're only certified to receive SNAP benefits for six months. And at that six month period, six months from that initial application, you are going to need to complete a semi annual reporting form. Now, this is not a difficult form to fill out. It's a one page form. They just want to know if anything has changed. Uh, but if it's not completed on time, your benefits are going to be cut off. So it's not difficult, but it is very, very important. And then six months from that semi-annual reporting form, often called a SAR, you actually will need to complete a one-year recertification. And a one-year recertification is essentially a new application. So in addition to completing that one-year recertification, you will also again need to submit verification documents and again complete a SNAP interview. Now, the thing that's important about these two pieces of paperwork, the semi-annual reporting form and the one-year recertification, is that these are going to be mailed to you. And you are responsible for completing these, this paperwork and turning it in on time, whether you receive it in the mail or not. So all the time we talk to people who, you know, their mail got lost or they're not living in a place where they can reliably receive mail. There are so many reasons that people might not receive this paperwork in the mail, but unfortunately they are in charge of completing this paperwork, whether they receive it or not. So the single best tip that I can give you is if you apply for SNAP six months from that application, go in your phone or your calendar or whatever you're using to keep track of dates and put a reminder to yourself. That way, if you don't receive that paperwork, you still know that you have that SAR or you know that you have that recertification coming up because filling that out is going to help keep you connected to your benefits. And then finally, I want to talk to you about the My Compass PA mobile app. So this is a mobile app that you can use to manage your benefits. Uh, so you can use the app once you have been approved for benefits to check your benefit status. You can submit verification documents using your phone camera. You can submit a semi-annual reporting form through the app. And then finally, you can check your balance and recent transactions. So this is a great way to stay connected to and manage your benefits once you've been approved for them. So just to review kind of everything that you need to do. So number one, you are going to apply uh, through Compass online, over the phone, or in person. Although I am really going to suggest that you apply over the phone using our SNAP hotline. Once you apply, you are going to upload mail, fax, or drop off required documents to the County Assistance Office or Customer Service Center. You're gonna have an interview with a caseworker before day 30. Once approved, your EBT card will be mailed to you or it can be picked up at the county assistance office. 
Once you assign a PIN number for your card, benefits should be available and ready to use. And then keep an eye out for that six month and annual renewals. And then I also just want to talk to you about this because this is something that I talk to, you know, specifically with, with college students often. One of the hesitancies that I hear people say when they're, you know, not sure if they want to apply for SNAP is, I don't want to apply because there are probably other people who need the support so much more than I do. Other people have it worse. So I just want to remind you that SNAP is not a capped program. What this means is that there's no limit to how many people can apply for and receive SNAP benefits. SNAP is considered an entitlement program, which means that anyone who meets all of the eligibility criteria can and should apply for benefits. And when more people apply for benefits, like for example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the program will grow. It will expand to accommodate those additional applicants. So there should, you know, that should not be um, in the way of applying for SNAP because your receipt of SNAP is not going to affect whether another person receives SNAP. Those are two completely separate things. And then finally, you know, we have been talking about SNAP this whole time. And I do, you know, recognize that unfortunately SNAP for college students is a pretty restricted thing. And so I did just want to talk to you about two additional resources that you can use if you don't qualify for SNAP. Or if you do, these are additional resources you can use. So number one is at the Coalition Against Hunger, we have a food pantry map. Um, and this does cover the five county region. And so our food pantry map is helpful because you can search by address to find a food pantry that is close to you. And then you can also search by day of the week. So you can find a food pantry that's open at a time that is convenient to you. If you visit this food pantry map, not only will we help you find a food pantry and let you know what it is, where it is, but we're also going to give you all of the important information, like when it's open, and then you know what the restrictions are for visiting that food pantry. Because sometimes food pantries have restrictions. For example, they will only serve people who live in a certain zip code, or in order to be served at the food pantry, you need to show a photo ID. And we try to give you all of that information, hopefully before you visit the food pantry, so that when you do visit the food pantry, you have all of the information that you need in order to be served. And then finally, Community Resource Connects. So Community Resource Connects is uh, a online platform for free or low cost resources. And this is searchable by zip code. Um, and as you can see, what's great about Community Resource Connects is that it's not just food. There are lots of different resources on this website. So, you know, food and transit, safety and recovery counseling, uh, adult medical care, legal and financial resources. So this is a really great one-stop shop if you're looking for many different resources sort of, you know, under the free and low cost umbrella, this is a great resource for you. So that's everything that I have for you today, but I definitely want to leave time if there are any questions or anything else that people wanted to talk about, I'd be very happy to answer them now. I had a question with yeah. the deductions part. Yeah. So um, I pay my phone bill, but my phone bill is my mom's name and like I pay it every month. Like, would it still be considered a deduction if it's in yeah. her name? Yeah, that's a great question. So what's going to happen um, with the utility deduction is if you call our SNAP hotline, um, they're going to ask, do you pay utilities and, you know, do you pay a phone bill? And then there's actually a standard deduction for that utility. So if you pay your phone bill, it's sort of a yes or no answer. And if you pay it, you're going to qualify for that standard amount that every single person who pays a phone bill um, would be able to claim as a deduction on their SNAP. Okay. Uh, Seth has a couple questions for you, Katie. <laughs> Hi, Katie. This has been really helpful. Um, uh, and, and just as a as a um, anecdote, and and just I think reinforcing the importance of of doing this kind of education, especially related to college students. I was having dinner with uh, a high level official from the 
state government administration yesterday who also didn't know a lot about this. Um, and at one point was like, college students don't qualify for SNAP. And I was like, that's not necessarily true. Um, but, but I think, again, I think there's so much confusion around this. So I, I really appreciate your um, very concise and clear um, uh, 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 communication when, when it comes to uh, eligibility and how this all works. But so just a couple of questions for clarification. Um, so uh, as a special group college students, um, just to, to clarify, it's, it's college, college students are a special group if they are uh, enrolled more than half time. Like, so if you're, if you're less than half time, you, you um, would apply and you'd be eligible under sort of standard rules. But if you're over half time, that's when you're sort of that special population. Correct. Yeah, that's absolutely okay. right. And then, um, uh, and, and again, under, under normal rules, when it comes to work study, um, do students, so students not only have to qualify for federal work study, but they have to be in a federal work study position under normal rules. Um, and do they have to also be working 20 hours or more a week through their federal work study position or no? Great question. Um, really glad that we have a chance to, to clarify this. So no. Um, under normal rules, students would need to qualify for a federal work study and be working federal work study any amount per week. So one hour of federal work study per week would qualify you for SNAP. So yeah, you definitely do not need to be working 20 hours of federal work study per week. Um, thank you so much for asking that question. That's really, really helpful. I, I actually know of some students who I think, um, I know they qualify for work study and they were really concerned because they didn't work their 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 package doesn't allow them to work up to 20 hours a week and i think that's the case for a lot of students and so when i think they see the 20 hour under sort of the same list of bullets Absolutely. they get nervous and then i think sometimes they even just write 20 even though it's not necessarily accurate but i think this is this is good for for reassuring students that they can put literally any um the accurate amount of hours absolutely that. and then um just uh, so one of the things that I know Mallory mentioned um, as part of her internship is, is we're, we're, um, uh, we're, we're creating a space in our resource pantry called a benefits hub where students, once they're at the pantry, can, can stop in and get some assistance um, with applying and finding and, and identifying different kinds of resources and supports, including SNAP. Um, I guess I'm curious um, if, you know, if we can make our space in the in the resource pantry a space where students can, you know, use the hotline and call the hotline. Um, if you have any recommendations for anything that we can tell those students to come prepared with if they're going to call the hotline from our benefits hub space that there, you know, I know you mentioned some verification documents. Um, if there's anything that we can encourage them to, to bring with them as they sort of sit down. In, in that space to, to make that phone call? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think there are, you know, a few ways to connect students through the Benefit Hub to the hotline that we could talk about offline, sort of some more creative thinking. Um, but I do just want to remind everybody, you know, the thing about our SNAP hotline is uh, there's not going to be a long wait. So you're not going to spend a lot of time waiting on the phone. Um, but the way that we do that is we do um, not do applications during that initial call. So when you call us, it is going to be sort of a simpler eligibility screening that's going to take about five minutes and then you'll be placed on a list and you'll receive a call back. Um, so that initial eligibility screening is going to be pretty basic information, you know, your name, your address. If you're a college student, we are going to ask about those additional eligibility criteria to make sure that you meet one of them. Um, you know, we are going to ask if you can estimate your monthly income before taxes, although we don't need that nitty gritty information until that call back to complete the application. So at the time that you call us for that initial call, again, it's going to be about five minutes on the phone with someone. Um, and at that time, the person that you speak to can give you an estimate of when you would be receiving that call back. Unfortunately, we're not able to like schedule appointments or tell you exactly when you'll receive that call back, um, but they are able to uh, have an estimate of when you would receive callback. Um, and then what I can do is we do have, you know, a list or I can add it as a slide into this slideshow of the sort of information that you would want to have prepared when you are speaking with a SNAP counselor for that application. So I can make sure that I send that information when I follow up so that students can see, you know, the verification documents that they might need and the sort of information that they should have ready when they're completing that application. 
that's that's super helpful. One last question, it's a very, I think it's a simple question. You may have already mentioned it. Um, for the interviews that take place for uh, during the application process, those happen. They, those can happen um, over the phone or virtually, or they have to be in person. Yeah, so um, the vast majority of them do happen over the phone. Um, and the way that that process is actually going to work, this is a good thing to kind of go over so people can know what to expect, is when your application is submitted, um, the day that your application is submitted, they're going to try to, they're just going to cold call you and try to have an interview with you immediately so that they can continue to process that application. If you miss that call, there is a hotline number that you can call for what's called an on-demand interview. So you call that number, someone will answer the phone and they can do the interview with, uh, with you right there and then. Um, and that's just in an effort to make sure that uh, scheduling an interview is not a barrier for people having their application approved. So again, uh, day of application, they will try to cold call you and have an interview right away. If you miss that call, no worries. There is a hotline number that you can call for an on-demand interview where you'll be able to do your interview, you know, exactly when you call. Those are all my questions. Thank you. Great. Hey, this is Megan. I actually have a question too. Yeah. Um, so students are considered enrolled from the time they begin their first term until the, you know, graduation, whatnot. Does that mean they can use their college address for SNAP, their county that they're coming from? Yes. Yeah. So when uh, when you call the SNAP hotline, and this is something that our SNAP counselors can walk you through, um, you can use your college address. You will need to submit sort of, you know, some proof of uh, right. residency. So that, you know, might be a student ID or a piece of mail at the place where you're living. So there will need to be some sort of proof of residency, um, but you can use your college address. Great. Even over the summer? Correct. Um, I have a question. You said you talked more about like the work study on campus and having 20 hours a week. If I don't, I work near my school. Would that still count as like the 20 hours a week? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So great question. Um, and just to kind of clarify and hopefully make this a little bit more clear. So work study um, is one of the ways that you can qualify and you can be working any amount of work study, any number of hours a week. So that's sort of one category. Um, working in any non-work study job is a completely separate category. Um, and that's where the 20 hours per week would come in. So if you were working at, you know, an off-campus job for 20 hours a week, that would qualify you for SNAP. Um, so the work study and the sort of non-work study jobs uh, are unrelated qualifications. Does that help at all or make sense? Yeah. It's just on the um, that so you can just talk and she should be here. I had a question about um, I, I came in late, so I'm sorry if like you already went over this in the PowerPoint. Um, my first question was just that is is this PowerPoint going to be available somewhere? Can you go to that? Okay, cool. And we're also recording the presentation, and that will be available online as well after the fact. Okay, so awesome. And then my second question um, was like. Is there any plan, because I'm an independent student as a part of the Promise program, and like the Promise program already handles so much, but, um, and it's like, but I was wondering if there's any way that like in the future where I can use my participation in that program as like, I guess, the proof of necessary eligibility as a college student, um, or I don't know how that would handle, because I know not every university has like a program as good as the Promise program or even has a program like it in the first place for independent um, homeless or foster care, oh, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. um, or foster care students or unaccompanied youths in general. And I was just wondering how that would work during the application process or if that's something I could use personally or other students could use to um, use that in the application process. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so unfortunately, you know, these are federal regulations and we don't really have a lot of wiggle room as far as sort of what the federal regulations say we have to do with uh, college student eligibility. So right now the federal regulations are federal work study. And so, you know, if, if, 
you're a part of a program that is not federal work study, unfortunately, right now, there isn't a way that that could be used um, to qualify you as a college student for SNAP. Okay. I, I mean, I also know that the program does like qualify you for work study automatically. So I guess that was just like a given. But thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And to be honest, I'm not very familiar with that program. Um, so definitely, you know, I, I would talk to someone who's who's more involved in that program and might be more familiar about sort of the crossover between that program and federal work study. It does, I mean, it, to me, it seems like um, I, I think to your point, Katie, like some some important um, lobbying of the federal government for yeah. expanding eligibility requirements at minimum to to include, um, you know, programs that serve unaccompanied or uh, you know, former foster youth and then homeless uh, homeless students as well. And I, I feel I I don't know if there's any federal designation of, of or, or programs for those students. I know that Pennsylvania has has a number, so I would, but it, but it, it's it's I think it's a really valuable um, requested question. Uh, but I, I understand it's also limited by federal regulation. Absolutely. And I mean, SNAP for college students and these regulations are a huge area of conversation among advocates. Um, you know, people absolutely understand that these qualifications are very restrictive and just do not reflect the reality of, you know, many college students in America. So that's definitely a huge area of conversation among advocates. Um, definitely, you know, trying to push for change in this area. Are there any more um, questions from anybody? Um, I'm going to put my email address in the chat as well if anybody uh, has any additional questions or um, questions about how they can access the uh, presentation after. Um, it will be posted on um, the Benefits Hub page um, through the Resource Pantry website. Um, I encourage you all to check it out if you have additional questions, um, call the SNAP hotline um, and come visit us at the pantry if you're needing at, um, additional supports um, on campus and in the community. Uh, I just wanted to thank you, Katie, for um, your time and this wonderful presentation. Um, Absolutely. And I just want to say I am going to put my email in the chat as well. Please, anybody feel free to reach out to me. I absolutely understand that there might be some questions that you would rather address privately. Um, so anyone who has any outstanding questions from this presentation, please feel free to reach out to me directly. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Bye.